Senator from Colorado. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that the quorum call be vitiated. Without objection. And I ask for the yeas and nays. Is the there a sufficient second? There appears to be. The questions on the nomination? The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka, Mr. Alexander, Ms. Aya, Mr. Barrasso, Mr. Balkus, Mr. Begich, Mr. Bennett, Mr. Bingaman, Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blunt, Mr. Bozeman, Mrs. Boxer, Mr. Brown of Massachusetts, Mr. Brown of Ohio. Mr. Burr, Ms. Cantwell, Mr. Cardin. Mr. Carper. Mr. Casey. Mr. Chambliss. Mr. Coates. Mr. Coburn. Mr. Cochran. Ms. Collins. Mr. Conrad. Mr. Coons. Mr. Corker. Mr. Cornyn. Mr. Crapo. Mr. Dement. Mr. Durbin. Mr. Henson. Strenzi. Mrs. Feinstein. Mr. Franken. Mrs. Gillibrand. Mr. Graham. Mr. Grassley. Mrs. Hagen. Mr. Harkin. Mr. Hatch. Mr. Hoven.
Mrs. Hutchison. Mr. Inhofe. Mr. Inouye. Mr. Isaacson. Mr. Johans. Mr. Johnson of Wisconsin. Mr. Johnson of South Dakota. Mr. Carey. Mr. Kirk. Ms. Klobuchar. Mr. Cole. <coughs> Mr. Kyle. Ms. Landrew. Mr. Lautenberg. Mr. Leahy. Mr. Lee. Mr. Levin. Mr. Lieberman. Mr. Luger. Mr. Manchin. Mr. McCain. Mrs. McCaskill. Mr. McConnell. Mr. Menendez. Mr. Merkley. Ms. Mikulski. Mr. Moran. Ms. Murkowski. Mrs. Murray. Mr. Nelson of Nebraska. Mr. Nelson of Florida. Mr. Paul. Mr. Portman. Mr. Pryor. Mr. Reed of Rhode Island. Mr. Reed of Nevada. Mr. Rich. Mr. 
Mr. Roberts. Mr. Rockefeller. Mr. Rubio. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Schumer. Mr. Sessions. Mr. Shaheen. Mr. Shelby. Ms. Snow. Ms. Stabenow. Mr. Tester. Mr. Thune. Mr. Toomey. Mr. Udall of Colorado. Mr. Udall of New Mexico. Mr. Vitter. Mr. Warner. Mr. Webb. Mr. Whitehouse. Mr. Wicker. Mr. Wyden. Senators voting in the affirmative. Begich, Bennett, Bingaman, Boxer, Brown of Ohio, Cantwell, Carper, Casey, Coates, Coburn, Cochran, Collins, Crapo, Durbin, Enzi, Feinstein, Franken, Grassley, Hatch, Isaacson, Johans, Johnson of Wisconsin, Johnson of South Dakota, Cole, Leahy, Lee, Levin, Lieberman, Luger, McCain, McCaskill, Menendez, Moran, Murray, Nelson of Nebraska,
Paul, Portman, Reed of Nevada, Roberts, Rubio, Shaheen, Tester, Warner, Webb. Mr. Carey, Mr. Carey, aye. Mr. Nelson of Florida, Mr. Nelson of Florida, aye. Mr. Inouye, Mr. Inouye, aye. Mr. Burr, Mr. Burr, aye. Mr. Akaka, Mr. Akaka, aye. Mr. Wyden, Mr. Wyden. Aye. Mr. Brown of Massachusetts. Mr. Brown of Massachusetts. Aye. Mr. Coons. Mr. Coons. Aye. Mr. Baucus. Mr. Baucus. Aye. Mr. Blumenthal. Mr. Blumenthal. Aye. Mrs. Gillibrand. Mrs. Gillibrand. Aye. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sanders. Aye. Mr. Schumer. Mr. Schumer. Aye. Mr. Udall of New Mexico. Mr. Udall of New Mexico. Aye. Mr. Whitehouse. Mr. Whitehouse. Aye. Mr. Cardin. Mr. Cardin. Aye. Mr. Pryor. Mr. Pryor. Aye. Mr. Inhofe. Mr. Inhofe. Aye. Mr. Bozeman. Mr. Bozeman. Aye. Mr. Shelby. Mr. Shelby. Aye. Ms. Snow. Ms. Snow. Aye. Mr. Manchin, Mr. Manchin. Aye. Mr. Hoven, Mr. Hoven. Aye. Sessions. Mr. Sessions. Aye. Mr. Harkin. Mr. Harkin. Aye. Mr. Udall of Colorado. Mr. Udall of Colorado. Aye. Ms. Murkowski, Ms. Murkowski, aye. Ms. Landrew, Ms. Landrew, aye. Mr. Chambliss, Mr. Chambliss, aye. Mr. Ensign, Mr. Ensign, aye.
Mrs. Hagen. Mrs. Hagen. Aye. Barrasso. Mr. Barrasso. Aye. Mr. Corker. Mr. Corker. Aye. Ms. Mikulski. Ms. Mikulski. Aye. Mr. Thune. Mr. Thune. Aye. Mr. Rockefeller. Mr. Rockefeller. Aye. Ms. Ayat. Ms. Ayat. Aye. Mr. Alexander. Mr. Alexander. Aye. Mr. Kyle, Mr. Kyle, aye. Mr. Cornyn, Mr. Cornyn, aye. Mr. Blunt, Mr. Blunt, aye. Mr. McConnell, Mr. McConnell, aye.
Gomez. Change of record. Is there any senator wishing to vote or change their vote? If not, on this vote, it's 86 yeas, no nays, uh, and the confirmation is approved. Under the previous order, the motion to reconsider is considered made and laid upon the table. The president will be immediately notified of the Senate's action, and the Senate will resume legislative session. Mr. President. Senator from Delaware. I ask unanimous consent the Senate proceed to a period of morning business with senators permitted to speak for up to 10 minutes each. Without objection. Mr. President, I rise today to speak about the rallies that have occurred all over this country today and to add my voice to theirs. Mr. President, today Americans in all 50 states are gathering at hundreds of rallies and events to stand together in unity in defense of the collective bargaining rights of public employees, rights that I believe are now under attack in Wisconsin, Ohio, and in other states across this country. And that those demonstrations have been held today is no mere coincidence. For on this very day, 43 years ago, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was killed in Memphis, Tennessee, while standing up for the rights of 1,300 public sanitation workers. Working men and women gathered early today in Wilmington to declare we are one. And within the hour of this speech, thousands more will gather in Madison, Wisconsin, to protest what, in my view, is the scandalous move by Governor Walker to strip Wisconsin's long-standing collective bargaining rights from public sector employees. Before coming to this body, I served as the county executive of Newcastle County, Delaware, for six years. And before becoming governor of Wisconsin, Governor Scott Walker was also a county executive, in his case, of Milwaukee County, and for eight years. I understand the difficult choices that executives face when they must adopt a balanced budget even in the toughest of economic and fiscal times. For as county executive, I too faced extremely difficult budget challenges, as did you, Mr. President, as the governor of West Virginia. But I rise today because I know from my experience in cutting spending and in balancing budgets that it can be done without stripping American workers of their fundamental rights to organize and collectively bargain. I know it because I've done it through collective bargaining and without resorting to blaming and draconian anti-union legislation. Newcastle County, Delaware is a mid-sized county government that serves just over half a million people, has a budget of about 230 million. As a county executive, I confronted a growing and real budget problem. Our housing boom had masked a deepening spending deficit, deficits that were unsustainable even before the economic collapse in 2008. And as our national and local economies tumbled, our government's revenue did as well. I'd already spent my first few years as county executive cutting spending each and every year, and the simple cuts had given away. We had only fundamental cuts left in front of us. We had already reduced library hours, ended popular public events, made difficult choices that many local governments and many state governments face today. But that wasn't enough. As with many state and local governments, our budget was three-quarters personnel costs, and we could not allow those costs continue to grow as health care and pension costs boomed. We needed to cut our people costs to get our budget under control. Now, in our case, in the case of the county I formerly served, more than 80 percent of the county workforce is represented by organized labor, mostly by AFSCME, but also the FOP and the IBEW. And we needed all groups, all groups Order, please. to come together and to share in the sacrifice that lay ahead. Mr. President, it was just two weeks ago, last, two years ago, last week that I rose before our county council and delivered the hardest budget address I'd ever given, one in which I laid out that we had two paths forward. One path would involve having all the suffering focused on about 150 to 200 public employees who would have to be laid off to balance our budget. And the other was sharing that sacrifice across our entire mostly unionized workforce. Ultimately, after many meetings, many negotiations, very hard talk and debate, and yes, even at one point, some layoffs. Every bargaining unit in our county government came to the table, worked collaboratively, and helped us reach the goal of cutting 5% of our total personnel costs, not just one year, but as the recession continued and deepened, a second year as well. Many of these great and dedicated public employees saw health care costs shift 
and benefit packages change as well. But together, they were willing to share that sacrifice, to work in the best interest of our county and the public, and to acknowledge that we are one. In some ways, seeking a legislative solution such as has been done in Wisconsin, trying to simply strip away the right to be organized, to be at the bargaining table, might have seemed easier. Working together, as you know, Mr. President, as labor and management is not an easy path. No one wants to hear that they have to do more with less, especially when it comes to their own paychecks. And public employees in Delaware and all across this country are, in my view, not just the backbone of our community, but the backbone of our middle class. They are the policemen, the paramedics, the 911 call takers, the emergency sewer repairmen, the librarians, the teachers, the health service workers, and the prison guards, the folks who keep our community safe, healthy, and prepared for the future day in and day out. And in my view, where public employees come together to organize and seek collective representation on workplace issues, we ought to respect those choices. Collective bargaining serves as a critical check on our system, and its long and storied history is an important part of American history and American values. It is that check that led to the end of child labor practices, that led to the 40-hour work week and the weekend, to workplace safety rules, and ended legal sweatshops. It is a critical check against excesses and overreach by management and by the marketplace. Mr. President, I stand here today to remind all of us that labor unions and hundreds of thousands of public employees they represent in this country are not the enemy. We all know that this country faces a significant, almost devastating national debt and annual budget deficit. And we are going to have to make shared sacrifices and tough choices to get through these next few years. But that does not require that we strip the collective bargaining rights of the hundreds of thousands of public employees who serve us in the federal government and the hundreds of thousands, even millions of public employees who serve our nation at each and every level of government. More often than not, they do the difficult, the dirty, and the dangerous jobs that keep us safe and make our community strong. And they simply, in my view, do not deserve to be demonized, but rather to be listened to, respected, and partnered with as together we seek solutions to the challenges facing our country now and in the future. In my view, passing new laws to eliminate their basic collective bargaining rights is wrong, and we can do it better by working together. So today I join with all those who are standing up for these fundamental rights of the American worker and join them in declaring we are one. Mr. President, I note the lack of a quorum. Mr. President. Will the Senator withhold his suggestion? Yes, Mr. President. Senator from Ohio. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I, I came to the floor for about the same reason Senator Coons did. I appreciate the comments from the senator from Delaware in his first uh, beginning of his first term in office, and he obviously understands uh, the importance of worker rights, the importance of, of collective bargaining. He recognizes that I do, that in my state, when collective bargaining passed 30 years ago, uh, that we, we, we no longer saw blue flu where police officers called in because they had no ability to bargain, organize and bargain collectively. They'd call in sick the same day. Uh, they had no other way of expressing themselves. We've seen significant labor peace when we didn't always have labor peace on a lot of these issues prior to the early 1980s in my state where we have collective bargaining. We also, um, for my colleagues that have followed the news, and I think people are very aware of this in my state, um, we have seen Governor Kasich recently sign legislation to take away those, those bargaining rights. And that's why I come to the floor today, uh, in part to celebrate We Are One, an organization that says people of faith, people who belong to trade unions, uh, people who care about economic justice, people who support uh, strong community local services, police, fire, nursing, teaching, um, come together to, 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 to honor both Dr. King, who is, as um, Senator Kuhn said, Dr. King, who was assassinated 43 years ago today because he was standing with workers in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, sanitation workers, um, some had been crushed to death by heavy machinery on the job, had no ability to bargain collectively, nobody to fight for them, most of them African American, um, most had no real right to job safety, decent wages, decent benefits. Dr. King understood understood that worker rights is a human right and that that's why he stood up. Um, the debate, yes, the debate in state houses across America, in Wisconsin, Ohio, and other places, is about collective bargaining, but it's really 
not just collective bargaining. It's about rights. It's about opportunity. It's about the future of the middle class. The American middle class, as Senator Coons pointed out, didn't, didn't happen by chance. Uh, those aspiring to the middle class had to work hard and play the rule, play by the rules in order to enter it. The middle class was created after people <clears throat> worked together to demand a minimum wage, safe workplaces, pensions, social security, basic fairness. The middle class in many ways in this country was a direct outgrowth created with the passage in this body some 70 plus years ago of collective bargaining, the right to bar organize and bargain collectively, guaranteeing both ultimately private sector workers then later public sector workers. Now last fall we heard many of the winners, particularly Republican winners in the election in my state and I think across the country, talk about loss of jobs, the job loss that began during the during the Bush administration when President Obama took office, we were losing 700,000 jobs a month. We're now beginning to gain jobs. We've done that the last 12 or 13 months, especially in manufacturing. We know manufacturing jobs create a middle class. But after winning these elections last fall in my state, instead of focusing on jobs as they did during the election, too many politicians are governing by ideology and seeking to settle old scores. At a time when the middle class is struggling more than any time in my my lifetimes, when workers see their productivity going up and up and up, but see their wages flat or see their hours even cut back, American families are burdened by new attacks on their rights. About a month and a half ago, I had a round table in an Episcopal church on State House Square in Columbus, listening to teachers and firefighters and nurses and police officers and other public employees. And what struck me is that, as I, as I heard, what struck me is I heard uh, outside, and outside meaning from politicians, conservative politicians who wanted to, to, to cut off collective bargaining rights, take those rights away. Um, those people making accusations that these firefighters and police officers and teachers were, were lazy, were overpaid, had too much time off, had um, too big a pensions, had too much, too big a health care benefits. As I was hearing that, I was listening, I was hearing that from, from critics, but I was listening one-on-one -on -one to these public employees. A teacher told me when she, a young teacher who's been teaching only about 10 years, when she goes to the bargaining table, she doesn't just talk about wages and benefits and all of that. She's also negotiating for smaller class size. A police officer I talked to wasn't just talking about pensions and pay. He was negotiating for a bulletproof vest for him and his men and women who were also police officers. So these aren't just, these negotiations are not just for the, for, for more money for public dollars spent on behalf of these police, fire, 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 fire teachers and, help, and nurses. They're also about helping society, improving society, expanding on the middle class. But it's clear that those attacking collective bargaining more more interested in taking rights away than creating jobs. And it's clear as it is in Ohio with a bill that passed the House of Representatives which would give Ohio the most restrictive voter registration laws in the nation that they would seek to limit our basic freedoms. Restrict worker rights, restrict the right to vote, rest cut back on women's, uh, women's rights. That's, that's got something to do, I'm missing this, that's got something to do with creating jobs and strengthening our economy. Let me, let me for a second, Mr. President, for, for a couple of moments, put a human face on, on all of this. I, a f I have a friend who's a firefighter named George in Willoughby, Ohio. And he wrote me this letter af right after the governor signed this legislation taking away uh, his, his rights, taking away bargaining rights for a huge number of police officers and firefighters and, and, and teachers and healthcare workers and nurses and others. He said, I join my proud profession knowing I would never be rich. I truly join knowing I would be helping people. I join knowing I would be able to raise a family. I join knowing I would have a pension in the end. As a 20-year-old kid, 21-year-old kid entering this profession, I weighed heavily on the helping people and the pure excitement of the job. Now as a 41-year-old firefighter who has been beaten down both physically and emotionally, I'll admit that my pension now plays a role in my driving force to go to work every day. I've always been the firefighter that the bosses look to when a task needs done. I'll soon be a 42-year-old firefighter in my 21st year of service. I'm six and a half years from being able to retire. 
This job has torn up my knees, requiring surgery to one of them. This job has injured my back on several occasions, twice requiring extensive time off to rehab. I'm doing everything possible to avoid surgery. This job has caused memories that will stick with me for the rest of my life, the kind of memories that make you go home and hug your wife and kids and thank God that they are safe. I mention all this because we as public servants, as you know, are being attacked in Ohio. We are being attacked in our profession as well as our retirement. Our fundamental rights, the foundation of our profession, are being attacked. Collective bargaining is the only way we've been able to improve safety as well as maintain a quality of life for our families. This system provides both the taxpayer and the public servant from leaders on both sides who choose to rule with an iron fist. I'm now one of our beat up senior firefighters who's rapidly re approaching retirement age. Where do threats of pension changes leave me or the many others like me if I'm unable to finish my ser years of service due to injury? Where do those changes leave me if my employer decides it's fiscally responsible to lay off higher paid, beat up senior firefighters to keep lower paid younger firefighters? Under uh, I'll get back to the letter in a second, but understand, Mr. President, under the legislation, my understanding is under the legislation that Governor Kasich signed, that management then would be able to say, well, this firefighter is more likely to get hurt, he's older, we're paying more, we've got to lay off five firefighters, so we'll lay off five of them in their 40s who are paid more and get the younger ones, and that's just too bad, they're not going to have enough years to retire. That's what taking away collective bargaining rights, that's what busting the union um, for these firefighters or police officers or teachers or nurses can do. Back to the letter, Mr. President. In Willoughby, due to economic conditions, we've not replaced firefighters who have died or retired. In 1990, we ran 2,100 incidents per year. In 2010, we ran just under 5,000 incidents. In 20 years, went from 2,100 runs to 5,000 runs. I'm, not sure, I'm, I'm sure we're not the only city who continues to operate understaffed with higher volumes. I consider myself a moderate when it comes to politics. I've always voted for those who support me as a public servant. That's what true public servants do. That was George, a firefighter in Lake County, Ohio, in Willoughby, just east of Cleveland. Mr. President, when, what, again, this is not just about collective bargaining. It's about what we want our country to be. Dr. King, whom we honor as who was assassinated 43 years ago, as I said today. Dr. King delivered the 1965 commencement address in Antioch College in Yellow Springs, Ohio, where Coretta Scott attended many years before. On the moral question of confronting poverty, Dr. King said, there's no deficit in human resources. The deficit is in human will. Yes, we all care about budget deficits. We know we need to move towards a balanced budget. We know our first focus needs to be creating jobs. We want to invest smartly and cut wisely. But we also care about the education deficit. We care about the infrastructure deficit. We care about disparities in education and health care based on class and race and gender. We care about the lack of economic mobility for millions of Americans in underserved urban areas and underserved rural Appalachian areas like much of the presiding officer state which borders an underserved rural area in my state. We care, these are the deficits, we care about these deficits in our nation. But what is greater is our deficit, is, what is greater is our deficit and the lack of will to close them. The question becomes, Mr. President, then, do we have the will to do the right thing? Do we have the will to to fight back in Ohio when, uh, when the governor and legislature have eliminated collective bargaining, now effective in 90 days? Do we have the fight, the will to fight for the middle class? Do we have the will to strengthen our country as we cut the budget to move towards a balanced budget, but not cut the things that matter for a productive, strong middle class, for middle class Americans, and for all those people in Ohio and West Virginia and around this country that, want, that aspire to join the middle class? Mr. President, I, I, I yield the floor. I notice the absence of a Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
President. Senator from Ohio. I ask unanimous consent to uh, dispense the quorum call. Without objection. President, I ask unanimous consent. When the Senate completes its business today, it adjourn until 10 a.m. on Tuesday, April 5th, that following the prayer and pledge, the journal of proceedings be approved to date, the morning hour be deemed expired, and the time for the two leaders be reserved for their use later in the day. The Senate proceed to a period of morning business until 11 a.m. with senators permitted to speak therein for up to 10 minutes each with the time equally divided and controlled between the two leaders or their designees with the Republicans controlling the first half and majority. The final half and that following morning business, the Senate proceed to consideration of H.R. 4, 1099 repeal under the previous order. Further, Mr. President, the Senate stand in recess from 1230 till 215 to allow for the weekly caucus meetings. Without objection. Mr. President, Senators should expect two roll call votes at approximately 12 noon in relation to 1099 repeal. We're working to reach an agreement in the small business bill. Senators will be notified when additional votes are scheduled. Mr. Senator, if there's no, Mr. President, if there's no further business to come before the Senate, I ask that it adjourn under the previous order. Without objection. The Senate stands adjourned until 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. The Senate gaveling out. Earlier today, members approved the nomination of Jimmy Reyna to serve on the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals. He's the first Hispanic to sit on that.